Time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and we will start with listed questions. I call Mr. Declan Kearney. Mr. Kearney. Question number one, Speaker. I call the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs. Our agri-food industry is a key driver for the Northern Ireland economy, with farming and food processing industries generating turnover in 2014 of around £5 billion. Agri-food will continue to be one of our most strategically important sectors going forward. I will be working closely with my ministerial colleagues to deliver an economic environment in which the agri-food industry continues to flourish and grow. Delivering on the actions contained in the Northern Ireland Executive Response to the Agri-Food Strategy Board's Going for Growth is a key priority for both DERA and the Department for the Economy. Good progress has been made so far by government in partnership with the Agri-Food Strategy Board to implement key actions, including the opening of new export markets, launch of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme with business development groups and farm family key skills, development of a land management strategy, work to develop a commercially focused marketing body, the opening of a new Agri-Food Quest competence centre to drive forward research and development within the sector, the opening of the sustainable use of poultry litter scheme, implementation of the Food Fortress scheme, which is a world leading feed assurance programme, and development of a feed advisory register. I work closely with the Economy Minister to drive forward further progress on our key priorities to deliver growth for the sector. This includes through the support our departments provide to agri-food companies in looking for new export markets and in progressing the development of the agri-food marketing body. Following last week's vote taken by the people of the United Kingdom to leave the EU, the attentions of the Northern Ireland Executive will turn to supporting both farmers and processors in the future. And I've already given a commitment to the industry that I will take a lead in these discussions. Mr. Kearney for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and may I wish you every best wish in your, uh, in your new ministry in the time ahead. Can I also ask the Minister, uh, does she agree with me that the Supply Chain Forum is an important body and uh, indicate a progress report in relation to its work, including the number of meetings which have taken place in recent times? Minister. Thank the, the member for his question and for his good wishes. The Supply Chain Forum is one of the actions being taken forward by the Ag Agri-Food Strategy Board um, coming out of the Going for Growth report. Um, hosted by the Agri-Food Strategy Board, the forum has met twice, bringing together over 75 representatives to each event from across the supply chain. This has included primary producers, growers, processors, retailers, bankers, and representatives from government. We have engaged in open and frank discussions on issues affecting the sector, including market volatility, contracts, land management and communication and collaboration across the supply chain, the price farmers receive for their produce and that other payments at any point in the agri-food supply chain is a commercial matter and it's outside the remit of my department. Nevertheless, I am supportive of actions that will tackle unfair practices within the supply chain and provide a fair return for all of those who are involved. The Supply Chain Forum offers a useful environment to bring together representatives from across the supply chain to discuss common challenges and also opportunities for the agri-food sector and also to build and strengthen relationships. I look forward to discussing the way ahead with regards to the Supply Chain Forum with the Agri-Food Strategy Board and we'd be keen to hear from them what other steps they are taking to strengthen the agri-food supply chain. Thank you. I call Mr Harold McKay. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I would also like to congratulate the Minister on her new post and as spokesperson for the Ulster Unions Party, I hope to work with you in the near future. Thank you. Can the Minister detail when the next stage of the Farm Business Improvement Scheme will be announced and can she give a commitment that her announcement will include a detailed list of eligible items? Uh, thank, thank the Member for his question and indeed um, the Farm Business Improvement Scheme is a key action for my department and the scheme will be delivered through the Rural Development Programme. Um, 
it consists of a number of, of measures, including knowledge transfer, cooperation, innovation, and capital investment, as the member will know. Um, and it is being phased out in a, role, in a phased way. Um, the knowledge transfer schemes have opened, and the develop, business development groups and family um, farm families' key skills to assist farmers in developing um, their thinking and, and business plans and in making the right decisions about developing their business. Um, with regards to the rollout of the next stage of the capital scheme, this will include grant support linked to the needs um, in the farmers' business plans at 40% of eligible costs. The proposed scheme will be designed to deliver benefits for farm businesses in terms of improved sustainability and improved productivity. Um, I would like this to be much further on than it, was, than it is. Um, obviously, this is a, a program which has been worked on for some considerable time, um, and I am, I am hopeful that we will be making an announcement um, in the near future with regards to this program. Mr. William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <coughs> the Minister will be aware that farmers, farmers have, uh, across a number of sectors, uh, have experienced, experienced very serious problems in relation to the incomes they receive from their produce. What can the, the Minister do in the here and now to help those farmers? Uh, I thank the, the member for his question. I am concerned about the, the challenging market conditions which do face our agri-food sectors, um, the particular difficulties in the dairy and pig sectors, and I will want to look um, closely at what, what action my department can take to help farmers cope with market volatility. I am keen to press um, DEFRA and the EU on meaningful action to help um, address particular needs of the local industry in the, in the near future. Um, we'll also continue to make the most of measures to build resilience, um, efficiency and competitiveness through the, the Rural Development Programme. Um, my officials have been in regular and close contact with representatives of the main banks who operate in Northern Ireland. Indeed, I'm, I'm meeting those representatives next week. Um, and this is just discussing support for farming sector. Um, the price farmers receive for the produce and that others pay at any point in the agri-food supply chain, um, as I've mentioned in a, in a previous response, is a matter which is outside of my department, um, but obviously working to ensure that farmers get the best um, money for their produce. Thank you. Mr. Roy Beggs. Question number two. Minister. The release of some 40,000 litres of red diesel into the Irish Sea from the Caterpillar factory at Lorne was a high severity incident and statutory samples were lifted on Saturday the 11th of June with a view to prosecution and as such I'm limited in what I can say. Diesel is a light oil and when it reached the sea it spread rapidly and with the warmer temperatures much of it evaporated within the first few days after the spill. The remainder of the oil has been broken down by natural dispersion and bio um, degradation and very little evidence of the spill can now be observed. I can confirm that the circumstances that led to the release are being fully investigated by the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. Caterpillar NI will be required to put in place safeguards to ensure this sort of incident cannot happen in the future. The incident was reported to the water pollution hotline by the port of Larne at 8.55 a.m. on Saturday the 11th of June. Officials from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency and Marine and Fisheries Division worked closely together and provided regular updates to the Mid and East Antrim Council, the Food Standards Agency and the Public Health Agency to allow them to assess the consequences of the incident for their areas of responsibility. Mr. Beggs, for a supplementary. Uh, I thank you for that response, Minister. Uh, I'm aware that most of the uh, diesel had evaporated, and indeed uh, those using the lock for sailing or those living near it uh, were aware of, of the stench of it at, at that time. Uh, but can I ask the Minister, in terms of uh, information flow, what is the Minister doing to ensure that there's clarity as to who is ultimately responsible uh, for such investigation. I'm thinking in terms, should people be contacting the Environment uh, Agency, as the Minister's mentioned, or is it the Maritime Agency, or 
is it as what happens on many occasions, simply people contact the local council because they're not aware as to who actually they should contact? Thank the, the member for his question. And obviously, um, incidents such as this are quite distressing. Um, and um, it's important that um, on first sight that they are reported as quickly as possible. Um, there is a hotline which can be um, uh, accessed um, and should be used. Um, and in the event that people aren't um, available, to, aren't able to use that, um, to contact their local council. Mr. Gordon Lyons. Mr. Speaker, um, the minister will be aware that there are uh, sites uh, near the spill um, that were that are very sensitive. Um, can she uh, outline if they were impacted? Um, I thank the, the member for his question, uh, and a number of sites ha um, have have been identified, and um, there have been ongoing um, pieces of work uh, with regards to water sampling and water quality. Um, there were samples lifted at Browns Bay, Ballygally, Carnlock and Sandy Bay on the 22nd of June and these are now being tested for the presence of diesel. Mr Oliver McMullen. And can I thank the Minister for her answer so far. Minister, uh, could you tell us what role your department is, uh, is playing in ensuring other companies other than Caterpillar have adequate risk assessments and protocols in place so this doesn't happen again? But it's my information, quite a lot of the drainage runs down into the sea, not only from Caterpillar, but from other uh, sources in that same area. I thank the, the member for his question. Um, and from January this year, all non-exempt oil storage facilities in Northern Ireland must comply with the control of pollution regulations, uh, and that was for 2010. Um, it's a matter for those companies that store oil to ensure that they comply with the requirements of the regulations, which are designed primarily through the provision of appropriate um, secondary containment to minimise the risk of oil spillages from occurring. Um, as one of the a number of associated pollution prevention initiatives working um, within existing resources, N NIEA has in place a risk-based programme of oil storage regulations visits um, to a limited number of premises each year just to ensure that those premises inspected are compliant um, with the regulations um, and they also are working alongside other UK environmental regulators. Um, NIEA widely promotes oil related um, pollution prevention guidance um, that includes um, issues around um, storage and also um, the waste disposal. Um, and the use of oil separators. So NIA um, does contribute um, to this and actively promotes oil care the oil care campaign. Mr. Stuart Dixon. You, uh, Deputy Speaker. Minister, thank you for your answer thus far and indeed thank you for the written answer which you've already provided me with regards to this incident. Um, but Minister, can I ask you, would you not agree with me that incidents like this uh, highlight the need for an independent environmental protection agency in Northern Ireland, ever so much more so important now that we are likely to leave, the United, to, to leave the European Union? And what guarantee can you give that you will provide the same protection that the European Union provides when it comes to environmental matters? Um, thank the, the member for his question and obviously good environmental governance encompasses a great deal more than the creation, creation of a, an independent um, agency. Um, now while I understand that there are a number of stakeholders in the past do believe that um, an independent agency would raise the standard of environmental protection in Northern Ireland, I don't believe that there is compelling evidence to support that view. Um, I'm happy to listen to the views of stakeholders with regards to this. Um, but it's not sufficient to say that because other jurisdictions have one that we should, should have one as well. Um, policy needs to be evidence-based and I believe that it's important that we focus on outcomes rather than simply on structures. Um, NIEA has already recognised that there are areas in which improvements can be made. Um, some of those improvements are already being made and can be seen um, and then there are further improvements have been made. Um, so at this stage, I, I'm not in a position to, to look at that outside of having further conversations. I call Mr. Smith, Mr. Philip Smith. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, question three, Minister. Um, the agri-food sector is of major importance to our economy. It contributes over £1.1 billion in added value and is responsible for 8% of all private sector employment. DERA is an economic department and there are natural synergies with the Department for the Economy. 
It is essential that we work together to support the long-term future and profitability of the agri-food industry. Adding value to our primary products begins by identifying and securing new markets and the development of new products to meet the needs of those marketplaces. DARA is already working closely with the Department for the Economy and InvestNI to support this right along the supply chain, particularly in the areas of exports and innovation. Examples of joint working include the ongoing work to identify and facilitate access to key strategic export markets, the use of InvestNI innovation vouchers at CAFRI facilities and collaboration on 2016, the year of food and drink. My department is also providing support through the Rural Development Programme to increase the competitiveness of the whole agri-food sector. I see significant opportunities for even, work, uh, for even closer working between my department and the Department for the Economy in relation to the agri-food industry and I've instructed my officials to explore areas where a more strategic joined up approach could deliver more effective support to the sector. Mr. Smith. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I uh, thank the Minister for, for her answer. And, uh, the Minister will be well aware of last Saturday's very successful Cumber Early's Festival that I was pleased to initiate when I was on Ardsborough Council. Uh, how can our department further support enterprising producers like the Cumber Early Growers to both develop brand awareness and retain more control over their product? I thank the, the member for his question and, and I am very familiar with the, the Cumber Early's project and I want to congratulate those, all those who are involved and all the organisers um, but also the potato grower, growers within the area and I had the um, privilege of being able to attend during the Open Farm Weekend, um, Oars Farm who are very much leaders within the production of um, the Cumber Early. Um, obviously there are a number of initiatives which can be taken forward with regards to supporting supporting groups. Um, we're very keen in relation to looking at um, the, the marketing board, um, and which myself, along with Minister Hamilton, are, are trying to progress, um, and that's in, in conjunction with um, the, the industry. Um, this was identified um, as fundamental to long-term sustainability of the industry, and strategic market forces um, are required to maintain and develop, particularly around, around exports. Um, so, as I said, I'll, I'll be working with the Agri-Food Strategy Board in relation to that and other matters along with the Economy Minister as we move forward. I call Sinead Bradley. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, could I ask the Minister, please, could she give an uh, up-to-date uh, synopsis of any conversations she's had with executive colleagues or others in safeguarding and developing the export markets for the agri-food sector? I thank the, the member for her question uh, and obviously this is something which is very important and is reflected throughout the, the, the answers to my questions. Um, I see this department being very much a, an economic driver um, working alongside the Department of the Economy and I've had a number of conversations with my colleague in relation to that along with the industry. I call Mr Gordon Dunn. Thank you Mr Deputy Speaker. Following on from last Friday's positive results on Brexit, what discussions has the Minister had with the agricultural industry sector on doing business in the future? Um, thank the, the member for his question. Um, indeed, um, yesterday I, I met with members of the industry um, to discuss the outworkings um, of the result last last Friday. Um, this was a very, uh, a very useful meeting and is something which I intend to, to um, continue to do as we move forward through this. This was alongside, um, as I've mentioned before, the um, Department of the Economy um, and Simon Hamilton was also in attendance at that meeting. Um, we, there we had the Northern Ireland Food and Drink Association, the Agri-Food Strategy Board, Dairy UK, UFU, um, Northern Ireland Meat Exporters Association and the Northern Ireland Grain Trade Association. Call Mr. David Ford. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. In her initial answer, the Minister referred to looking at the strategic opportunities for work between her department and the Department of the Economy around growing uh, the opportunities for processing produce. But isn't it a bit disappointing, whilst that is a welcome statement, that three years after the fanfare of going for growth, so little appears to have happened so far? 
thank the, the member for his, his question. I think it was a question, maybe it was more of a, a criticism. There obviously were a number of um, targets which were set in relation to that. Um, in response to the first question which um, I gave to um, Mr Kearney, um, there are a number of key actions which um, um, were it to be implemented um, and, and, we've, and good progress has been made despite the, the members' view on this um, in, with regards to opening new export markets, the launch of the, the Foreign Business Improvement Scheme, development of land management strategy which is working along. Um, we have a, a developing a commercially focused marketing body which we, we should be looking at um, reasonably quickly um, and the opening of the agri-food um, quest competence. There's a number of things which um, can be seen as successful. Um, obviously this is a work which continues um, and we will be looking to work very closely with the, with the sector in order to progress that. Well, Mr Alex Maskey. Could I ask the Minister uh, for a question number four, Kesha over car, please? I understand that your question relates to the leader element of the Rural Development Programme, and I can advise that my department does not directly fund farmers under the leader initiative. However, farmers, as owners of a diversified business or their rural business, can apply to their local action group for leader grants. All successful applicants can avail of stage payments by firstly agreeing this approach with their local action group when their letter of offer is being drafted, then by submitting um, payment claims at various stages through their project to be reimbursed for the grant element of money they have invested. Mr. Maskey for a supplementary. Uh, could I thank the Minister for her answer and given the circumstances we now find ourselves in, I wonder, is the Minister in any position to uh, confirm whether or not the Rural Development uh, Programme will run to 2020, and will there be any shortfall in funding made available if there is a reduction from London? I thank the member for his question. And obviously, this is very early days in relation to any negotiated ex exit, exit. So at this stage, my um, department is moving on with the programme. Call Mr. Tom Buchanan. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, can the Minister update the House on when a capital grant scheme will uh, open for the industry to help those who wish to grow their own business? I uh, thank the, the member for his question uh, and I refer back to a response that I, I did give to another member in a previous question in that I, I am disappointed that we, aren't in a, we haven't been in a position to, to move this on um, much quicker. Again, this is a, a legacy um, that I've inherited, um, so uh, my, my officials will be looking to, um, to bring something forward very, very quickly on this. The full details of the capital investment element are subject to the outcome of a business case approval process. Um, once that process has been completed, um, it's planned to start a preparation stage for the scheme to provide information to potential applicants in advance of the scheme opening to allow farmers um, time to prepare. Um, subject to the business case approval, the um, Farm Business Improvement Scheme Capital Investment Scheme will be managed as two tiers um, and we are working through that. Um, Certain items will be ineligible for support as stipulated by the RDP regulation, such as um, like for like replacement um, or maintenance, consumables, consumables such as feed, fuel or sprays, um, and investments relating to non-agricultural animals and items to meet existing statutory requirements such as minimum um, slurry storage. Um, I will reiterate again that I am disappointed that this scheme hasn't opened earlier, um, but look to it um, being opened in the near future. Call Mr. Paul Gervin. Thank you. Question number five. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your consent, I will answer questions five and ten together. Um, so far, 23,753 farm businesses have been paid for their 2015 direct payments. Um, this is worth two. £134.5 million. This is 99.4% of applicants identified as eligible for the scheme. This leaves 88 eligible farm businesses which have yet to receive their direct payments for the 2015 scheme year. There are a number of reasons why eligible applicants may not have been paid for 2015. These include missing bank details, outstanding probate issues and disputes between business members. These reasons are largely outside of my department's ability to resolve and will usually depend on customers providing the necessary information. Payment can only be made in these cases when the necessary information is provided. Mr. Garvin for a supplementary. 
I thank, thank the Minister for her answer and I just want to take this opportunity to congratulate her on her post and wish her all the best. Uh, just in, in relation to the, uh, the active farmer assessment process and those that are awaiting uh, a decision on that, uh, is there many in that process and what work has been undertaken to actually uh, speed up the decision making along that line that those that are deemed as active farmers get their payments? Thank the, the member for his question and applicants for basic um, payment scheme must be able to demonstrate that they do enjoy um, the decision making powers, the benefits and financial risks in relation to the agriculture activity which is on the land for which their entitlements are requested. In 2015, a total of 1,638 applications were assessed and found not to meet this requirement. Um, 855 applications for a review of decision um, regarding active farmer have been received. 28 of these have been completed with 827 um, outstanding. It's not possible at this stage to give a date when they will all be assessed. However, I've asked my department to take action to ensure that applicants um, have certainty over the eligibility to claim um, from the basic payment scheme. I call Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I also thank the Minister for her answer? She will be aware of concerns that farmers who were subject to remote sensing in previous years had suffered delays in their payments, and this certainly came in for much criticism. How will the Minister ensure that those whose farms are included in the future are fully informed and that delays are avoided? And does she plan to review the targets? Um, I thank the, the member for her question. Um, and it is, it is my priority to get payments out um, in a timely fashion um, and to, to minimise um, where there are issues with regards to payments if those are expedited um, as quickly as possible. Um, my department works to ensure that all payments are made promptly uh, and will continue to do so in, in the future. And um, obviously, there have been, uh, an, there's been an increase in online up applications um, this year, and we're trying to put in processes to make um, the processes as, as easy as possible. Uh, I call uh, Mr. Justin McNulty. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And first off, I'd like to congratulate the Minister on her appointment and wish you well in the years, months and years ahead in your new role. Um, in light of the outcome of last week's EU referendum and the Leave campaign with, with which your, your party supported and with which your party said that we're all going to be better off as an outcome of us leaving, what guarantees can you give to our farmers that their single farm payments will continue beyond the two and a half year period? How, how, how much reassurance can you give them? How much comfort can you give them they, that they will be, in fact, better off as an outcome of the remainder? Minister. I thank the, the, thank the, the member, member for his question and, and obviously the outworkings of the, um, of the result last Friday are, are, st are still um, being worked through. Um, it was very clear um, during the campaign and during the assembly campaign that the majority of farmers were keen to, um, to leave the EU, um, primarily because of the issues around red tape and, and bureaucracy. And I noticed that the, the member is shaking his head. Um, but that's certainly the, the evidence which we were receiving, both in the doors and certainly in the, the number of um, visits which I have made in, in my time in office. Um, the, with regards to single farm payment, they will continue, that will continue to be paid um, while there is a negotiation to, to exit the EU. Uh, and certainly myself, along with executive colleagues, will work very closely with, with DEFRA in the, in the coming weeks and months ahead to ensure that, um, that Northern Ireland gets the best deal. Quick supplementary from uh, Mr. Ian Millen. From my good, uh, Kim Collier. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answers. Could I ask, uh, when does the Minister expect those farmers to receive their payments for 2015? Approximately. Um, what we are working on, I've, I've asked my officials to work um, through the, the current processes as quickly as possible, um, uh, and I hope to be in a, in a position in the near future to be able to give um, a, a further outline of the timescales for that. 
That ends the uh, period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Colum Eastwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I too welcome uh, the Minister to the Chamber and congratulate her on her uh, new role? Can I ask her um, for an update on progress uh, with the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund? Thank the, the member for his question. Um, the European Maritime Fisheries Fund um, is something which obviously uh, will give the opportunity for um, Northern Ireland to be able to invest in all sectors of the fishing industry. Um, over the next um, number of years, we have secured um, £23.51 million, pounds, um, with £13.7 million pounds available to support applications from fishermen, processors, aquaculture and community-led local development interests. With regards to the opening of the applications for um, Northern Ireland, um, I've had a number of meetings with my officials since coming into office. Um, I'm fully aware of the need to open the programme as quickly as possible. As someone who represents uh, a constituency with um, a fishing village, um, and certainly it's something which um, Port of Ogie will be looking forward to, along with Ard Glass and Gilgeel. Um, but I have instructed my officials to prioritise the um, finalisation of the business case um, and its submission to the Department of Finance for approval. Mr. Eastwood. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the, the Minister for, for her answer? But is she not concerned, like we're concerned, that this fund and many other funds uh, might go to the wall, given the fact uh, that some people in her party and in other parties are rushing to drag us out of the European Union against our will? And I thank the, the member for his question, and indeed um, he has concerns in relation to that, as he will also be aware that at this stage we are unclear as to um, the, the negotiations for Brexit and how long they will actually take. Um, in the meantime, I am quite clear that business will continue as usual in relation to, to pushing forward with this scheme as with others. I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister what discussions she has had with her counterparts in the South uh, given the uh, referendum uh, result um, in regards to the future of the farming sector across the island of Ireland? Minister. Uh, thank the member for her question. And, and at this stage, I haven't actually had any um, formal meetings with, with the Minister in the South. Um, it is something which I intend to do um, on Monday on the um, periphery of meetings with the NSMC. Um, I am I'm conscious of the concerns in relation to um, the movement of, of animals and also dairy products um, between North, Northern Ireland and, and the Republic of Ireland, um, but I will, continue, I will um, seek to have that meeting and be able to report back after that. Ms Boyle. Margaret, uh, can I thank the Minister for her response and also to um, add to that, Minister, what plans do you have to meet with the uh, industry uh, representatives? Uh, thank the, the member for her question. I met with industry representatives yesterday, actually on two occasions. I met with them at the LMC event, which where they were launching their new advertising campaign for um, um, farm insurance, quality farm assurance um, and later they came to meet with me in, in Parliament buildings um, and we had a very useful um, exchange and um, I hope that this will be the start of many conversations that we have as we move forward through this process. I call Mr Justin McNulty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, in Norma, we are proud of our orchards. We are the orchard county. Our orchards create huge employment in our, in our uh, countryside. They have many micro businesses spawning off, many innovative micro businesses being created off the back of our orchards. I'd like to know, Minister, what supports do you intend to give to our apple growers to ensure that their businesses remain viable and which continue, will continue to contribute to our economy and our tourism in Armagh? I thank the, the member for his questions and, and I recently visited Arma for the, for the show um, and, um, and will, will no doubt in the coming months have the opportunity to, to visit again uh, and, have for, and have conversations with the, with the apple growers. Um, 
I, I want to give an assurance to this chamber today that I, mean, I, I plan to um, assist all sectors within our farming and, and agri-food um, community and I, and I will continue to do that through this, obviously this, this, this challenging process that we're about to embark on. Um, there are obviously um, is that there's assistance in, in place with regards to the um, farm business improvement scheme and also the, hopefully then the capital element of that which will be launched um, shortly. Um, again, there are opportunities through Agri-Food Strategy Board and a number of other uh, programmes which, which they have been working through. So there will be, there will, will be and will continue to be assistance um, for those which you represent. Mr. McNulty. Content to move on? Move on. Okay, Mr. Pat Sheehan. Could I ask the Minister what impact leaving the East, the, the EC will have on, uh, or the EU rather, will have on uh, existing environmental protections? Um, thank, thank the, the, the member for his questions. Um, it's still very, very early to really have a, a clear picture um, in relation to the implications of this as a result of the, the Brexit vote. Um, existing legislation does remain, will remain um, and will continue to apply until um, there are conversations in relation to um, the, the Brexit. And it will very much depend on the form of Brexit um, and how this will take place. Um, if we remain as EU as part of the economic area, such as the Norway model, then most of the environmental protections which we have in place and the legislations that are there will, will, will remain. So it will be very much dependent on, on the type of Brexit. Mr. Sheehan. Uh, I was uh, thank, thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, but does the Minister think that the impact of leaving the EU is that the Assembly here will have to develop its own legislation around the environment and climate change? Mm -hmm. Minister. Um, with regards to that, it is very much dependent really on, um, on the outworkings of the negotiated exit. Um, my department and my, my officials are currently scoping in and around the issues um, of the environmental protections. Um, I do want to give assurance that it is certainly my aim to, that I want to enhance our environment moving forward and, and to ensure that it is protected. Um, the member has also mentioned um, issues in relation to climate change. Um, legislation is in place um, in the form of the UK Climate Change Act 2008. Um, and this act has set out um, targets which we are working to, to meet. Um, I will keep the need for local legislation in mind, and along with other measures which will help to reduce greenhouse gases. But our continued progress um, with regards to the reductions um, without a local climate change act um, shows our commitment to, to tackling um, greenhouse gas without the need for uh, a climate change act at this stage. I call Mr. Smith, Mr. Philip Smith. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, the provisional approval of China last year to allow pork imports was a major boost for local companies and pig farmers in Northern Ireland. Can the Minister provide an update on where exactly are, we are now in regards to this? Uh, thank the, the member for his question. And, and with regards to that, my officials have been working very closely um, with, the, with the pork sector. Um, there were remedial actions required, um, and a report has. We are now waiting for an updated report from the Chinese with regards to, to progress on that. Mr. Smith, I thank the minister for for her update. Uh, it is obviously positive that pork products that were previously considered as waste have now become items for export, uh, therefore helping to increase the overall value of the carcass for local farmers. Unfortunately, Minister, there is now frustration going amongst them and processors with what they see as excessive delays since the initial announcement was first made. Can the Minister detail the value of products the local industry is currently throwing away every week until final agreement can be reached on this important opportunity? Minister. I uh, thank the member for his question, and I don't have the detail of that, um, but I do know that um, we're working alongside the industry in order to assist them through this. Um, I, um, my intention is to meet with the pork industry and the processors um, in the very near future to discuss um, the issues with which um, the member has raised. Mr George Robinson is not in his place. I call Mr Steve Aiken. 
Uh, may, I thank, may I thank the Minister and uh, welcome her to the position. Uh, can the Minister give her assessment of the environmental importance of the Six Mile Water River and its watershed to South Antrim and beyond? I um, thank the member for his question and obviously all our waterways are important um, uh, and certainly um, I, there's, there's a value there for, for community and for, for tourism as well. Um, so with regards to that particular waterway, um, I do see value in it. I previously chaired the Culture, Arts and Leisure Committee and had very much um, a close involvement with regards to those involved with the waterways um, and also their, their anxiety in relation to, to pollution off those waterways. Um, waterways are, are something which is obviously um, now within my own department um, and it also falls with, with me with regards to um, the environmental protection of those waterways. Mr. Aiken. Mr. Aiken. Uh, Minister, this river can barely flow for a year without experiencing a significant pollution incident and all the devastating, that conse devastating consequences that come from it. The ecological damage that these incidents can cause is immeasurable, and you only had to talk to groups like the Six Mile River Trust or our many angling clubs and our great local councils to understand how these frequent spills are affecting the river and its wider ecosystem. Can I ask the Minister how she will ensure that the ecological and environmental protection of this vital resource is protected going forward? and whether she would give her, get, uh, consider giving the river and its ecosystem an improved protected status. Thank you. I want to thank the member for his question. Obviously, that was quite lengthy, and there were a number of elements within that, um, but I, I mean, which I will look at, and I will give consideration to the comments which he has made. Obviously, um, pollution in rivers is something which I find quite abhorrent. Um, I've had experience of that in my local area, um, where you have repeat offenders, um, and obviously, um, those need to be prosecuted and brought to, to before the courts. Um, with regards to the element of uh, uh, special status, um, I'm willing to have a conversation with the member in relation to that. Mr. Colin McGrath uh, is not in his place. I call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I ask the, the Minister if she supports a ban on hunting with dogs in Northern Ireland? Um, thank the, the member for his question. And obviously, hunting is a, uh, is a matter which I have no power over. Um, but on a personal level, yes, I, I do. Thank the minister for her response. Uh, it was my understanding that the, uh, her department would have power in relation to this particular issue. Um, would she be willing to set out more clearly to the House uh, as to why it is impossible for her to introduce legislation to uh, introduce a ban on hunting with dogs in Northern Ireland? Minister. Um, it is my understanding that I have no powers to regulate or ban hunting of foxes and other wild animals with dogs, but I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation with the member with regards to this. Thank you. Uh, as Mr Mackay is not in his place, um, we have come to the end of the topical questions. The minister has done particularly well. I congratulate her, and I ask the House to take its ease until 2.45.